More bits of tech hiding here than normal, slow room. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Torsten Bell. You're very welcome to the Resolution Foundation. Um, now, I know what you're all thinking. You're in a basement of a posh London townhouse. There's a geezer talking with a suspiciously dodgy-sounding Eastern European name. The, um, but this is not a John le Carré novel, and there are no Czech spies in the building, at least that we're aware of. If you are a Czech spy, if you leave now, it'll make everyone's life. Uh, a lot <laughs> easier, the, um, or should do. Now, um, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the outlook for living standards for families in Britain today, and more importantly, what we can do to uh, improve it. Now, the order of play, now we have published a long report today. I know you've all read it twice already before you've come, uh, but it's on the website. I'm not going to show you all of that today. We're going to give you a short presentation, giving you the headlines, though, of what our projections for the next few years of living standards uh, for families across Britain looks like, the highs and the lows. Then uh, John McDonnell, who is the show Chancellor of the Exchequer and doesn't really need a full introduction to you all, is going to tell you how a Labour government uh, is going to or would try to improve against those forecasts because little sneak preview, they're not very perky. Uh, and then Stephanie, who is head of Bloomberg Economics, the Bloomberg and the Economics are in capitals because she's in charge of an empire in Bloomberg now, uh, is going to uh, give us a response to that. And then we're going to have a Q&A with you because if we haven't given you the answers to how we improve things, maybe you'll have worked it out over the course of the 45 minutes and you can tell us the answers. So that is the plan. Uh, so we'll kick off with um, a kind of just reminder of what has been the roller coaster of living standards in Britain over the last decade. The, um, uh, this is just to show you two things, really. Uh, the economy was, the living standards were bumping along at around 2% growth uh, per annum pre-crisis, particularly fast at the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, a bit slower in the middle of the 2000s. Uh, then it turns out, if you didn't already know, that the biggest banking crisis in British history is really bad for living standards. Those are the bars going down in the middle. 2010, 2011, catastrophic, driven by, yes, rising unemployment, but also by fast rising inflation and pay being held down during that phase. Uh, the bit that probably people didn't notice too much at the time, but there was a little mini boom, as we call it, uh, around 2015, 2014, 2015, very, very low inflation, zero, in fact, uh, and very fast employment growth driving better income uh, growth um, just before the 2015 uh, general election. That's where the facts stop and we start into our projections, which are obviously as interesting as the facts. Here they are. Uh, so the year we are in, financial year 2017-18, we think is the low point for the current cycle of uh, incomes, and that's because we think there's no growth at all going on this year. Zero. On average, this is for typical households. We think it's basically flat across this year. That is because, as you all know, inflation has been higher, 3%. Um, around 3% for a good chunk of this year above the Bank of England's target. Uh, that has squeezed pay. Real pay has been falling for most of this year. It's still falling now on an annual basis. And employment growth has got plateaued at record highs, i.e. we're not getting further benefits to living standards from ever-rising employment. We've got a very high level, but it doesn't boost uh, growth any further. Um, the good news is that, that will then we then think that that zero growth phase will start to ease over the coming years growth will return, but the bad news is it will only get up to 1.3% even at the end of this forecast period based on the Office of Budget Responsibility's quite pessimistic view of what's going on with pay and productivity in the British economy. So bad news, this year is awful. Good news, it will start to get better next year. Uh, kind of mm, pretty awful news, it won't get that much better across the forecast period. But it's not the same picture for all groups. So this is just showing you um, a deeper dive into our forecasts and splitting it out by what we call low and middle income working age families. These are the people that the Resolution Foundation exists to make sure policymakers don't ignore. This is everybody who is in work but in the bottom half of the uh, of the pay of the income distribution. So they're not rich, but they are. They're not. Uh, they're, but they are working. And I'm also showing you in red here everybody else who's higher income and working. So the rest of the working population is in red. And the point to take away from this is, I said to you that income growth will return next year for the population, the typical uh, household in Britain. For low and middle income households, for reasons I'm going to come on to explain, we don't think that growth will return until 2020. So they've got three years of income stagnation, and that's obviously on the back of a pretty disastrous decade uh, before. Higher income families here aren't seeing really fast income growth, but they are seeing some income growth across those years. So why are we getting that difference? What's going on? So this is showing you uh, a chart of um, income growth, but in a much more detailed way. On the poorest families on the left, 
the richest families on the right. And obviously you want your line to be higher because that's showing you income growth taking place. And this is annual income growth. Uh, and this is showing you our forecast for the next three years. Uh, so 17, 18 on the base of 16, 17. So 17, 18, 18, 19, 19, 20 cumulatively. Uh, so you can see what's going on here, which is that we're seeing actual income falls for the poorer third of Britain and slow growth for everybody else. That's basically the big picture of what we think is happening in the next few years. The, the falls at the bottom are being driven by very large benefit cuts that have taken place but are now being rolled out over the next three, few years. And so although um, nobody's doing really well, the poorer families are seeing their incomes cut the most. This is a combination of the benefit freeze but also cuts to work allowance and universal credit and particularly big cuts to family benefits for large families. The, um, that is what's driving the shape of that line. Now, what does that feel like for human beings and for people living in Britain while that's going on? Well, the most similar phase, in the last time we saw big rises in inequality in Britain, is the 1980s. This is showing you exactly the same line, but what happened in the 80s, not now. So again, poorest families on the left, richest families on the right. So the good thing about the 80s, uh, not the music, but was... The, or the haircuts, I, I'm tempted to put a mullet reference in here, but apparently that's not acceptable, uh, then was that at least everybody was seeing quite fast income growth. So whatever everyone said, there were, a lot, you can have, there were lots of views about whether the 80s were good or bad, but people were seeing fast income growth, almost whichever part of the income distribution they were in, middle, top, they're not at the very bottom. The, um, but the better off families were seeing much faster. Insofar as there is a big story about inequality in Britain, it is this line. This is what caused the level of inequality we have. We haven't seen anything like that before, and we've not seen anything like that since. The next few years have the same shape as that line, but they don't have the kind of big phones and the champagne sipping yuppies because nobody's doing very well. So this is about the bottom being left behind in the next few years, not about the rich running away, which is what the 1980s uh, was about. What does that mean for... Um, oh, that's just sorry. This is just to say, we, once those benefit cuts have worked their way through, we're expecting flatter but still bad income growth at the beginning, at the end of this parliament, so the last first two years of the next decade, but I mean, who knows, the world doesn't really exist that far out, but that's what we project. What does that mean for inequality? Uh, it means we, we think there's a decent, it's pretty hard for inequality not to rise in the last few years of this decade. Um, if we're unlucky, that will take inequality to the highest levels recorded. That on some measures, not on all, I just want to flag two things. Like the genie, the genie is the blue line. This is the normal measure people talk about that looks at inequality right across the whole income spectrum and measures it. So that looks like after quite big falls during the crisis, lots of bankers lost lots of money in the crisis, inequality fell slightly. Um, I know you're all crying. Um, but inequality is then rising across the next few years this parliament. Just then, if you focus just on the yellow line, this is showing you the middle of the income distribution compared to the bottom. So the average, the typical person, household, compared to someone who's in the bottom 10% of households. So if that line goes up, it means the bottom is doing worse than the middle. Yeah? And that is a traditional measure of poverty. And I'm only showing you this line. Our paper doesn't do, spend lots of time on poverty. But that yellow line going up means that we think it's pretty, that means poverty is rising for the, for the years at the end of this decade. Again, we haven't seen a big poverty rise since the uh, 1990s. Uh, right, so we, this is again just repeating that forecast I showed you earlier, just f the whole time ahead for this parliament. We've got to beat that, one, because it's bad for everybody, and two, because it's rising, raising inequality. And so for a bit of hope, how could that be done? Well, policy and economics could change. Policy could change like this. This is just showing you a, an illustrative package of well, reversing a load of welfare cuts, funded, fully funded by some tax rises. So this is a cost-neutral package. It doesn't hurt the exchequer and shows you you can have the same overall income growth that we've got for the next few years but you can share it out more fairly so you can still you've still got the grimness on growth but you haven't got inequality increasing and that can be done in a relatively straightforward way this isn't like my ideal package but this is an illustration of a way you could do it and in particular by protecting some of the large families that are losing a lot of money uh, secondly, and this one is a version of this I think is more li most likely to happen, which is that earnings growth could come in more strongly than the OBR <laughs> predicted. So the OBR have a very pessimistic view of earnings growth in their November forecast. They'll almost certainly revise it up slightly. Uh, in March, the Bank of England, for example, the people here from the bank, have um, more optimistic wage forecasts. Wait, I mean, they're not optimistic, so don't get excited. They're just like less suicidal <laughs> than the uh, OBR's one. This illustration is showing you if there's 1% extra growth a year for the next few years 
which would still be below the average from pre-crisis, but gets you back towards that kind of level, what would happen? And you would get much better outcomes, but it doesn't help on inequality. Er earnings growth doesn't really help on inequality. Employment growth does. Lots of forecasts on that in our document if you want to see them. And stopping cutting people's benefits helps there as well. So earnings helps everybody, and it's a good thing, obviously. So just to summarise, the good news this year is grim, but it's as bad as it gets. Incomes should start growing next year is our projection. In brackets, the OBR is a bit more pessimistic than that, but you know, we'll find out who's right. The bad news is that even when they get going, they won't grow very fast, hitting 1.3% by the end of the parliament compared to 2.1% being the pre-crisis norm. The really bad news is that if you're just about managing families who we all said uh, we cared about and on the lessons of the last few years should be a bigger focus for politics that the next three years they don't see any income growth and they've got to wait till 2020 to get it. Uh, the ugly news is again despite everybody saying we've learned our lesson and that we know that a country scarred by home inequality is a bad thing we are choosing to increase it over the next few years uh, but the hope because we know we don't want to end you all in a bit of doom is that policy and economic forecasts can change uh, and in fact it's our job to make sure they do. So that's what John is now going to tell us how he's going to solve the, um, and you know, at some point uh, other people will too. So over to John. Thank you very much everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> can, I, um, can I avoid all KGB jokes for the time being if that's okay Torsten? You've tempted me but I won't. Can I thank Torsten as well for the invitation to speak um, and also for the work that the Resolution Foundation does, um, both in preparing and presenting this research, but also acting as our sort of statistical conscience in terms of policy making for, for all political parties. I'm grateful for that. Um, what the research does, it confirms what some of us, frankly, have argued for, for most of this decade, but whose truth, I, I think, is now unavoidable. Um, the austerity measures pursued by successive governments have been an economic disaster, not only for the performance of the economy of, as a whole, uh, and this really should be our primary concern, actually the people's living standards too. The, the analysis presented here confirms that working people, and those on low middle incomes especially, have suffered the worst decade for living standards for generations, perhaps as far back as the Napoleonic Wars. And the prognosis for the future is well, similarly bleak, um, with at best marginal recovery, but for many stagnating living standards. Um, but the Resolution Foundation set the title for this discussion of beating the forecasts. In some ways, it shouldn't be too hard to get the better of an economic forecast. I always like that J.K. Balbraith quote that economic forecasting exists to make astrology look good. But the argument presented here by the Resolution Foundation, based upon the official Office for Budget Responsibility forecast, is of, it's of a different kind, I think. We're not dealing here with a short, sharp shock of a recession or a sudden financial crisis. I think it's more like a long-term chronic illness that the British economy suffers from, that we have to address. And this illness predates the decision to leave the European Union, although... I have to say the lack of direction and political uncertainty the Conservatives have brought to that process has unquestionably exaggerated and ex exacerbated these issues. Even this government has managed, though, to identify some of the symptoms of the illness, uh, starting with exceptionally weak productivity growth. Steady improvements on productivity, meaning steady improvements in the efficiency of production, have been the motor of economic growth for industrial capitalism for over two centuries. Improvements on productivity over time have led to huge and sustained improvements in the standard of living for most people. And it's the, only, it's the only way over the long term that capitalism can sustain these improvements. Yet what we've seen in the UK in particular is that the crisis of 2008 seems to have led to a slide in productivity and economic growth. It causes, its causes are widely debated. Uh, some, like Google's chief economist, Hal Varian has, Varian, has said what we see as falling growth is in large part due to a measurement error. We aren't capturing the value produced by new information technology properly in our statistics, so we underestimate the real e economic changes happening. Or the US economist, Robert Solow, once put it, <laughs> how come I can see the computer revolution everywhere apart from the productivity statistics? 
For others, like Robert Gordon, productivity slump indicates a decline in the fundamental rate of innovation. Other explanations for it can be found in, well, from secular stagnation right the way through to the falling rate of profit. So these are big economic questions we can debate almost endlessly, but whatever the causes, one fact is not in serious doubt. Britain is now an outlier for poor economic performance in the rate of measured productivity growth, and most importantly now for living standards. Amongst major advanced economies since the crash, in fact, Britain's the only economy, the only major advanced economy where the economy has grown, even if only by a little, but wages have actually fallen. The experience is unique in modern British history. For 60 years, from the Second World War to the financial crisis, rising GDP meant broadly li rising living standards. When GDP rose, unemployment came down and wages went up. That link now has been seemingly broken. So actually it's no surprise that people express such cynicism in official forecasts and official pronouncements. So why would it matter if GDP goes up or down to people if they personally are still worse off? But falling wages for the most have sat alongside significant increases in the inequality of wealth since the crash. And more recently, as the foundation have shown, rising inequality now of incomes. And this has real economic consequences. Households and general paid down their debts in the aftermath of the crash. Yes, they did pay down debts. We saw that. But more recent years have seen a significant rise in their debts. This is a different kind of, since before the crash. Where the sharp increases in household debt came overwhelmingly before the crash through increasing mortgages, Instead, now it's unsecured lending on things like car finance and credit cards that has been the driver of growing indebtedness. So there are, there are three fundamental barriers to improving living standards for working people in Britain. First, that productivity is stagnated. Second, that the link between growth in the wider economy and improved living standards has been broken. And third, that inequality produces financial barriers to prosperity. So none of these fundamental issues I don't think can be properly dealt with by simply the redistribution of incomes, although, well, through taxation and spending alone of the kind we've seen by past governments in the past. It made sense when the economy was growing and creating the relatively secure, well-paid work. But those conditions came to an end in the crash of the 2000s. Instead, the challenges we now face require us to address the structural failings of the economy. Yes, the next Labour government will be committed to restoring funding to our public services, and we've pledged uh, £21 billion over the Parliament to address the cuts the Conservatives have made in the Work and Pensions budget, including a £3 billion a year commitment for universal credit. And we'll do that, yes, we'll do that through making sure we have a fair rate of taxation that's paid for by those wealthy people and businesses that can afford it. And we'll also do it by ensuring corporations and the wealthy pay their taxes. And the trans Tax Transparency and Enforcement Programme we presented at the last election will be the most comprehensive anti-tax avoidance programme ever implemented by a government in Britain. But seven years of Tory austerity have dragged our public services in some areas to an existential crisis. The figures for local government are truly shocking. More than three quarters of local councils believe that local authority funding is unsustainable. One in 10 fear that they will not be able to meet their statutory requirements, their statutory requirements to deliver core services. And I have to say it's not remotely good enough for the Chancellor to try and sneak through his spring statement due in just over a month without addressing these key issues. So today I've called upon him immediately to bring forward the funding needed to place our local authorities onto a sustainable financial footing for at least the next year. But we have to look further than the immediate symptoms of a failing economy. We have to look at the, the causes. And the failure on productivity is the direct result of a failure to invest. The economic evidence is increasingly clear. It was laid out by the LSE Growth Commission, amongst many others. Since the crash, this economy has substituted the creation of cheap, insecure work for investment in capital and in skills and technology that can create the decent jobs for the future. I have to say, ultimately, this failure is down to government. 
It beggars belief that London alone is set to receive half of all the new government transport investment made in the whole of England. There's a deep institutional bias at work here that deprives the regions and localities outside the City of London of investment. That in turn means great swathes of the country fail to meet their potential. So the next Labour government, through its £250 billion National Transformation Fund and its industrial strategy, will deliver investment across the whole country and will shift the thinking of government institutions towards the longer term. The industrial strategy we developed is centred on a broad social missions and is just one part of that overall development. So too will be critical institutional changes, like asking the OBR to take account of climate change and environmental damage in its long-term economic forecasts. We just don't need just a policy change from government. We need the overhaul of institutions and a cultural change that goes right the way across Whitehall. And alongside this, we'll, we'll deliver an overhaul of corporate governance, changing the incentives for our major corporations to focus more on long-term and social benefits and less on immediate returns. That will include looking at ways to improve the representation of workers and consumers on company boards and supervisory boards. We need a clear view on how our economy is changing and how it's likely to change in the future. So technological change is accelerating, most obviously, in the set of technologies around artificial intelligence and, and big data and widespread automation. But our legal and institutional structures are failing to keep pace. Britain is lagging far behind other comparable economies in the use of robotics. In manufacturing alone, we have the lowest rate of industrial robot use in the entire OECD. And British capitalism invests too little and it relies too much on underpaid, insecure work to compensate. So we need new institutions with different priorities for the future. Over the next period, Labour will be laying out its programme for how the benefits of rapid technological change can be shared right the way across society. We want to see a new generation of cooperative and collective ownership that can properly utilise these technologies for social good, creating a shared cooperative Uber, or placing the ownership and control of automation in the hands of the people, not a few corporations. And to achieve this, yes, we need institutions that are democratic, transparent, accountable and capable of making decisions for the long term. Unfortunately, decisions about how and where and in what to invest society's wealth are presently taken by institutions that are too often almost the ex exact opposite. Our financial institutions put too much money into short-term speculative investment and not enough into real value creation. As a result, we have the, well, the absurd situation where overall it's manufacturing and high technology sectors that are financing at the moment speculative investments in property and real estate. That's exactly the reverse of what a healthy economy should be doing. And finance should act as a servant, not a master for the real wealth creators. The final report of our Graham Turner's review of the UK's financial system is due in the next few months and we'll be paying close attention to its recommendations. We'll be consulting many of you in terms of how we go forward with the implementation of those recommendations. The National Investment Bank and network of regional development banks will be one major step forward in reducing and re in developing these recommendations and rebalancing our economy. Graham Turner's report sits alongside Bob Kurzak's report that we published on the reform of the Treasury and Prem Seekers on the reform of HMRC with a further report on regulation to follow. We publish a first stage report on the National Investment Bank with a further report to follow and the National Investment Bank will be key to the delivery of rebalancing our economy in the regions. And yes, for those Bank of England officials here, we've also mentioned a, a partial relocation of the Bank of England to Birmingham, which I'm sure Mark Carney will enjoy. For heavily indebted households, now growing in number and, f and in an increasing precarious position, exactly as the Resolution Foundation research has shown, we'll introduce some common sense measures to lighten the burden as well. So one part of this shifting the balance of market power in favour of labour, yes, it will mean rapidly raising the minimum wage to £10 an hour and removing some of the draconian restrictions on workplace rep representation. And that includes setting up a minister, Ministry for Employment to develop s sectoral collective bargaining and for regulation of the workplace to ensure people are paid the living wage. The programme we intend to present at the next election, yes, 
It will represent nothing less than the transformation of the British economy. We will fundamentally change the priorities of government. Successive administrations have spent too long trying to hammer society to fit the shape of the economy, rather than thinking about how the economy can best address the needs of society. So that will mean changing how government thinks about economic policy, not fixated on growth for the sake of growth, however and wherever it can be achieved, but on meaningful social outcomes like creating decent, secure work across the country and combating climate change. The situation as the status quo continues will be dire for working people of a public realm and public services that's disintegrating, of meaningless, underpaid and insecure work, and a future that's blighted, perhaps permanently, by the appalling consequence of climate change and environmental destruction. Labour believes that we can do better than this. These are the forecasts we intend to beat. So the potential is there to create a society, just to be clear, that's radically fairer, radically more democratic, radically more equal, based upon an economy that's economically and environmentally sustainable, economy that's prosperous, but where that prosperity is shared by all. That's how we'll beat the forecasts set out in the Resolution Foundation's <laughs> report today. Thank you. Thank you It's nice to end on we can do better because history and every other country around the world right now kind of proves we uh, yeah. can. Just one question before we um, turn to Stephanie, which is, is it, your, your basic argument is that what Britain needs is a big structural shift, not just sticking past yeah. or amelioration yeah. of particular policy mistakes now. The, um, so when you're giving that message to the British public, when should they expect the forecast <laughs> to start being beaten? Say, say you're in government tomorrow. Yeah. How, how long does structural change take to turn into human beings getting better off? I think people will, I think will, people will recognise the results rapidly, rapidly. The results of them having a say in terms of the work, the workplace, they then be able to ensure that they can be properly represented and negotiate a decent wage rise, a real living wage being introduced, and in terms of the delivery from those structural changes, the distribution of investment coming to their town, their region, that they've not seen on scale before. I've been touring around the country doing meeting after meeting. We've been doing these economic conferences now for two years, trying to raise the level of debate. And what's been startling is in some of the regions, the disproportionate level of investment that's coming to what they see as coming to London and the South East as against their level. So you, and it is, it is about some of the basics of the infrastructure, and they feel they're held back as a result of that. And it's staggering. You know, I was up in Huddersfield um, last Friday. And on transport investment, for every £12 down here in London, they get £1. And they're desperate for a direct link to London. Part of the problem is, is if you try a direct link to London, the East Coast line in private hands falls about. So renationalisation might help as well. Right. I wonder if we didn't get any renationalisation at all, but I'm glad it's come it up. Right, Stephanie, over to you. Um, I think I'm supposed to be, or you suggested that my I should be just uh, taking the sort of global view and say... You can do whatever you want. Britain's a basket Sorry. case, so why are we bothering to oh, think God. about this? But I don't want to do that. Okay, so I was a bit depressed Phew. when you said I might do that. Um, I mean, look, I, let me say, there are two kind of obvious bits of uh, cold water to throw on basically any meaningful conversation about uh, British economic policy uh, at the moment, which I guess you have to sort of start with, which is, you know... You can't, you can't ignore Brexit. It's fantastic to be sitting in this room uh, actually thinking about something beyond that. And I, I, I uh, think it's great that we've dedicated this session to it. But there are so many factors, uh, so much of the debate we all know is being sucked up by the sort of week to week concern and uncertainty <coughs> that businesses are facing and all of the political and thinking air that is taken up by Brexit. So. Um, we can't ignore all the ways in which the next Brexit's going to uh, interfere with the best laid plans of any any government. And it looks like this government doesn't even have any best laid plans. So it's not. Um, you <laughs> you can't. Also, I think you can't ignore what's happening in the rest of the world. And as Torsten said, there's actually lots of good news, which is uh, putting us to shame as a very open trading economy, which ought to be doing particularly well out of this period of uh, coordinated 
for the first time in a long time, converging global growth. But we shouldn't, rem we shouldn't forget that actually normally when you finally get all of the world growing together, uh, is really great, but it also tells you you're about to get to the end, you're about to get into a brick wall of some kind or another, that you're just going to reach limits um, which will show themselves in um, inflation, potentially, certainly potentially uh, financial difficulties and markets getting ahead of themselves. So we should sort of understand that there's not just the Brexit clock ticking, there's kind of a global recovery clock ticking which could mess with John's and, and anybody else's plans. I mean, we still haven't abolished boom and bust. There you go. Have we, we not haven't. done it? No, no. Well, remember, it was only Tory boom and bust that was abolished. Oh, fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, but so let's, so I, you can't ignore the rest of the world, you can't ignore Brexit, but let's ignore both of those things because okay. it's so nice to actually have a conversation okay. about what would be a good policy. Um, <coughs> we took, 80s without the yuppies is perhaps a good way of, of describing what we're facing. But it, it, it is rem worth remembering it's 80s without the unemployment as well, which is one of the main things that people... Uh, was the searing memory of the 80s, those who weren't just focused on um, uh, the yuppies. You know, we haven't got those 3 million unemployed, and that changes the debate. Uh, it is... Uh, and it could certainly changes the way we should think about how to make for better outcomes. And as John has rightly said, it sort of means, he, doesn't, he didn't even spell this out particularly, but it does mean it's right to focus on the quality of jobs and the quality of the growth we're getting because we've kind of discovered that jobs themselves and GDP growth themselves uh, are not just enough. I think the other thing that I like uh, about the focus of the speech was emphasising digital transformation, what the broader industrial changes that are happening globally and how can Britain get the best out of those and deliver people. Because I think that's, that's always going to be a better place to be and it's certainly you're more likely to bring people along with you if you're engaging with the rest of the world. And I th actually think Graham Turner's report, those of you who haven't seen the interim report, you know, and those of you who know Graham Turner, he does really get into the detail of what are the 10 most successful companies in particular areas, what are the true cutting edge technologies that are going to produce opportunities. It's worth having a look at just from a, a, a factual uh, standpoint. Um, so what's the conclusion when you engage with those uh, digital transformation, what's happening in industrial sectors, what do you want to do? Well, it means you do want to focus on uh, supporting and encouraging the right kind of investment, the quality of investment, um, and also on boosting demand, but not just any old demand, but the mm. demand you get from raising incomes of the lower and middle. And of course, that was the focus of Torsten's um, uh, discussion as well. Uh, I guess what you know, and you didn't, understandably, you didn't mention it in the speech, but I guess what worries me is that y you can, uh, you don't want to get distracted by big property right disputes if you're trying to encourage that kind of transformation <coughs> and outcome. So I do worry, you know, if you end up with, and I know you didn't mention it today, but if you end up with most of the headlines around labour economic policies and most of the debate being around how exactly you're going to <laughs> nationalise things and how you're potentially challenging property rights or undermining capitalism as we know it or any of those things. You know, however right or wrong you might be on the way things were done in the past or have, are being done now, it's just going to it's going to sap so much energy and, and support. I would say also don't get distracted, at least, or don't frame it in terms of uh, taxing the rich more versus um, the poor. I think, you know, what you do want is to focus it on, you know, what's the right balance of taxation on capital and labour mm. in an environment where actually labour is going to be quite <coughs> struggling to make a transition and we're maybe giving the wrong incentives to capital uh, you know, and as the more that it's around that and the quality of investment and that balance helping workers and companies get the right, the most out of transformation, I think the better place you'll be. And I think the only other thing I'd say, which again, and not to, to plug another report, I think this report's fantastic, but McK McKinsey Global Institute, who've done a lot of really <laughs> detailed studies of <laughs> productivity. <Top> standards. Productivity. <laughs> Global, global. Oh, wait, oh, wait, fine. No, no, what was interesting was it was actually kind of uh, barking <coughs> so the sort of resolution foundation area because they have, they always say this is how companies are doing their best and how can they get the most advantages out of digitalization. Uh, 
a going all the way through the report, they actually focus, when they say, OK, there's all these benefits to be had and productivity growth, they think 2% a year productivity growth you can get from getting the most out of digital transformations. What they're most worried about is actually you won't get enough demand to encourage mm. companies to make those investments. And you won't get, and one of the reasons why you wouldn't get enough demand is you won't have enough money for the lower and middle income. So they actually have, as one of the two main prongs of the policies they think should be the new uh, framework for thinking about this, is raising lower and middle incomes. And I thought that was really interesting. And the other side of it is competition policy, is making sure that companies have the right incentives. You know, if they're already making a lot of money on the very small amount of capital they've already invested, the recognition is that they don't have an incentive to do more investment, which is increasing demand, but also raising the potential. So I thought that was really interesting that that demand piece of this, even in a far, even in a supposedly doing quite well global economy, is a concern when they're saying our company's going to realise the benefits of this, and that's from the McKinsey standpoint, not just a public policy standpoint. The only and the other thing I would say is just on the sort of localism point. Uh, and some of you know I was involved um, in the Inclusive Growth Commission working with cities, and I don't think we got ni we didn't do enough on this. But you know, the signalling that comes from doing a big change, taking Bank of England up to parts of the Bank of England up to Birmingham, or whatever it is, that's fine. But I wonder whether that's really what we're talking about. I think what we're talking about is empowering all the local institutions and networks that already exist whether it's small, you know, your local union office or, or a community group or a local council to help people with the transitions and, and making those moves from one kind of a job to another kind of job and giving more opportunities. Because um, that's what we've sort of systematically undermined. You know, all these, it strikes me, the countries that are furthest along in digital transformation, the US and potentially the UK, are actually the ones that have done most to undermine the local institutions that would help people make those transitions. And creating a big new one, and lots of big new uh, regional investment banks and everything, my bias is that's going to do less than actually just empowering the networks you already have and saying, actually, we want, we want to help these people to be helping people make those difficult transitions. Great. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Why don't we pick up a few of those to get it started, and then everyone can be working out their answers to beating the forecasts. I hope you've got them. Um, so, John, one thing okay. Stephanie is encouraging us, she, she'd like a bit less property rights and a bit less taxing the rich and a bit more yeah. capital taxation. Okay, let me just come on to, on to those. In, if you look at the Grey Book, which was our alternative budget for the election, we were very careful about the way in which we posed the tax rise that we had. So we talked in income tax top 5% and not a significant hit on those people either. So it was extremely moderate. Mm. Uh, and actually, we didn't get the reaction against it that some people thought it was quite remarkable. Um, so then in terms of corporation tax, it was simply restore, well, restoring some of the cuts that had gone, but not going back to the original level under, under uh, New Labour in 2010. So again, I, I think we were relatively moderate on that. And it gave us a it gave us sufficient income to look at the, some of the key issues that Torsten's raised about um, what's happened on universal credit, etc. So I, that actually was quite well received because we we then promised we were able to promise 95 percent there wouldn't be an income tax raise and we wouldn't hit national insurance either. We've 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 held to that. Um, in, I think you're right in terms of how we portray what we're going to do in terms of public ownership in the future. Um, and there are some industries uh, take water if you. The Financial Times seems obsessed with water companies at the moment. I don't blame them um, because the expose of what's gone on is a scandal. And if you look at the opinion polls, I think it's anything between 70 and 80 percent in terms of support and bringing them back into some form of public ownership. And in Wales now, you have a not-for-profit water supply. So we're looking at all those different models. So we're certainly not going back to the old scale nationalisation. And again, what we, we won't get bogged down into to property rights. We'll have a mechanism, but we'll consult on that in detail in advance as well. And people are coming up with all sorts of very <coughs> ingenious ways. And I just say this, one of the things as well, different regions might be treated differently as well because of the nature of their, it, what they have at the moment in terms of what their investments and the scale of debt that they've, they've, they've brought about too. So I think in terms of that, water is so for rail is... 
again, in terms of popular demand, it's overwhelming now, and even amongst Conservative <coughs> voters now, saying bring rail back in. And again, we're not going to get into wrangles about property rights. It will be as the franchises drop and then we take over. But I have to say, you know, the two... Chris Grayling has nationalised more railway networks than any Labour minister of the last 20 years. You know, we've had, we had Connex go down in the southeast, back into public ownership and control, actually very effectively. East Coast Line in and out like a yo-yo, but whilst it's in the public management, contributing to the Treasury with a, relative, with a good efficient service as well. So I think people are comfortable around that. Other aspects in terms of energy, we're talking about looking at the German model, so we grow it on the, at the local level uh, on the basis of um, commitment to alternative energy in particular. And again, there's some really exciting projects around the country on that. So I don't think we're going to get into those sort of wrangles. The big issue that, that is problematic for us is PFIs. And our problem on PFIs is the, the, the financial drag that they have on existing institutions like health authorities and education, schools, etc., is, is got to be addressed in some way. So we're going to look at that creatively about how, how we do it. And again, there'll be different models on that. The other, can I just, on the other issue, um, the <coughs> this issue of demand, I think, is absolutely critical. We are going, Torsten is quite critical of us about what we did in our last manifesto around um, benefits, etc. You are, you are. That, and I think we went some way, but we wanted more fundamental reform of the system that we thought we could work out fairly rapidly. And it's one of the rapid changes I think people will see. But our focus is on quality work now. And it is not just on quality work, but making sure <coughs> that people, when they're in work, can also gain a fairer share of the rewards. So one of the pieces of work that we'll be looking at in this coming period, we had a, we had a conference two weeks ago on alternative forms of ownership, but one of the issues that came up there in debate is not just the development of cooperatives, either, but also having a real consultation about profit sharing as well in this country, um, which hasn't really caught on in the past, but has in other European countries in particular. The other issue is how we use pu public procurement more effectively. We had this conference, again, around the Preston model, the collaborative council, bringing the anchor agencies together to use procurement to create quality <coughs> jobs within their area. We want to use public procurement more effectively on raising standards at, at work <coughs> itself. This idea of the collective bargaining, uh, sectoral collective bargaining, is important to us because, again, it's around making sure people have a voice at work that can secure them the wages. Interesting enough, in all the consultations that we've taken place, um, People have been quite responsive to that, business leaders and others. Um, and we've been working closely with the Federation of Small Businesses, who the scourge for them is bogus self-employment and exploitation through that. So again, that's about how you raise standards of work, raise standards of living at the same time. The final point on, 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 um, on what, what, what has been said, this issue about relocation. I did a um, round table of business leaders in Birmingham. And what they were talking about, as comes from Graham Turner's report as well, is that how do we scale up the clusters that we've got? And relocation of, of some decision-making from London and South East will help them scale up their cluster and I think also inform that decision-making too. If you're sitting in the northwest, the northeast, it's a, the other issue that came up is it isn't just about cities. The real problem that we've got in some areas are the small towns outside the city areas, the coastal towns in particular. And again, part of that is largely around infrastructure, about not just rail, but also networking as well. So again, it's interesting, the feedback that you get is about how, how can we in our particular area develop those high-skilled jobs, but we need state support around some of these key issues about infrastructure. And just on, on the capital taxes, so the manifesto said... We should have. We should look at some capital taxes to pay for some social care. I think is my memory from. Wait. Uh, but it didn't say which ones. No. So go on. Why don't you tell us today? No, we we looked at financial transaction tax. You saw that. Yep. In, in that that was in the grey book. Uh, Avinash Pasod uh, did a seminar on that for us, which I think went down pretty well. Um, not necessarily with everyone in the city, but um, there's, it was a set, a set at a reasonable level as well. Um, we're now looking at where we go from here because that, that was a manifesto for the last election. We'll, we'll build upon that as the foundations itself, but I don't think we'll stray much beyond the Grey Book itself. 
Okay. Uh, um, so we can't okay. expect like a radical change to council tax or no. Or well, the, we tax want or? we want to start the debate. We put in the manifesto that we want a discussion around how we rebuild the tax base for local government. That's good. And one of the issues that we put in the manifesto was the discussion that came up around land value tax. Mm -hmm. That immediately was portrayed by the Daily Mail as a tax on gardens. No, it won't be. Um, but we, we've got to be we've got to be more open in our discussions. I'm particularly worried about local government. Local government is collapsing around our ears at the moment. And if you look at what's happened in children's services, the report that was brought out by the charities, uh, it's what they said is a crisis could be turned into a catastrophe. We've got to address that issue. That sounds good. Well, just to plug, in case you do get excited about inheritance or council tax, we'll have some detailed proposals coming out in the next few months I thought you might. bringing in quite a lot of money, I'm sure. Uh, that way attractive. Now, just before we open the audience, why don't you both just tell us, because this is all a bit depressing, so what, and don't worry about, like, step aside from, like, potentially running the country, just as economic kind of analysts, what, what do you think could turn out better in, you know, in what way could a lot of this pessimism from the OBR and others just be wrong? Like, is it possible, for example, that pay growth is about to take off and unlike Mark Carney's view and others, that the supply capacity of the UK economy is stronger and that we can sustain a return to pay growth of 4% of the kind we had before the crisis, or are we unremittingly negative? Just give us your, give us your best grounds for pe optimism before this lot get pessimistic again. I mean, actually, the best grounds for optimism is if you look in the U US, uh, at the moment, the wages that are growing fastest and have been consistently for the last 18 months are in the bottom, the bottom fifth. Uh, and there has been a, and actually the, the lower 40% are doing, have seen a sort of step change in the last 18 months. And actually it's the top fifth who had, had also done worse, had actually done worse since the financial crisis than they had done before. Um, and then we're sort of jumping around. They have not seen a big uh, increase. So whatever the, the, the demand that we're seeing now, as we reach what I said might be the latter stage of the economic cycle, <coughs> actually does seem to be putting money into, even before everything to do with Donald Trump, whether that's worked or not, uh, does seem to be putting money into the pockets. Now, if you, if you believe that we are, uh, as most, certainly McKinsey and many others have found, the UK has relatively similar pattern in terms of what's happened to productivity, not employment, but what's happened in productivity across sectors and, and wages, you might say uh, that was quite a big source of encouragement. Whether it would be 4%, I don't know, but at the moment it's over 4% that it's growing in that, the lower yeah, part of the UK, of the US. I mean, that chart I showed you which of inequality, income inequality going up in the UK at the moment, that line is doing, if I drew that chart but for earnings, not for incomes, so poorest earners on the left, richest earners on the right, the poorest earners are getting by far the biggest pay rises over the last two years and will do right through to 2020 in the UK. So we are, insofar as, it's pre, insofar as we are pre-distributing mm. incomes right now, the, the labour market is, and because of very high employment you mentioned, which benefits <coughs> poorest households the most, we are pre-distributing e equality and then we're coming along with tax and benefit changes that clobber the poor and undo it. So that, that chart I showed you showing income inequality rising is despite earnings inequality falling faster than it has fallen in any time in measured uh, history. We'll probably publish, we're, we need to, Adam, where's, where's Adam gone? Adam, we need to publish the thing this afternoon. Pre we're pre-distributing equality at the moment and we are redistributing inequality. And that is the opposite of what we all thought happens in yeah. modern economies. Now, you know, the state is doing some of the pre-distributing via the minimum wage, so it's not all that. But you know, seven percent pay rises for the bottom over the last two years, compared to like two for the every, for everybody else. So the um, I mean, we don't really know what's going on with the top one percent. They don't tell us very well. Anyway, John Coleman, optimism. What's your best optimism? I can't give you that. I'm afraid. Oh, right. um, I think look, I'll, I'll, the best I can go, the best I can go to is I think the OBR, OBR report on the spring budget will either demonstrate a marginal increase in, in the yeah. pessimistic predictions, but I think it'll be marginal. Otherwise, it'll be rather stag stagnation. The point that Steph made is that, um, it, the only optimism I can see is if we can try and get through Brexit now in some, as rapidly as we possibly can in terms of <laughs> setting out a clear direction for the country, and then hopefully the government accepting Labour's proposals, or at least for the two-year transition period, where we stay in the single market and stay in the customs union. <coughs> if we can get that agreed quickly over the next couple of months, we might get an element of some form of stability. But again, what will come out of checkers today is, is your guess as good as mine. The problem is, is nothing seems to stick with this cabinet. Um, so the, uh, let, me, uh, let me just say this other thing as well. 
What I worry about is um, Guy Standing is one of our advisors, and he, you know, invented the term precariat. I worry about the growth of the precariat in this country. Um, I represent a working-class multicultural constituency on the edge of West London, where we have a housing crisis we've not seen since the Second World War, where people are working all hours God send just to keep a roof over their heads, where people are living in sheds and garages rented out to them, and that's families, and where they see no no future. But they're working hard some of them two or three jobs, but low pay jobs. And I think we're seeing, a, we're seeing a growth of that. So where you might see some ele elevation of it, salaries, that is on the basis of people working intensively hard and actually being intensively exploited as well. Okay. I'm not sure that counts as optimism, <laughs> but anyway. No. The, um, but it is true. <laughs> right, let's get some questions, answers, and others. The, um, there's a lady here, Rob. And then, who's got another mic? Was it? George. George is hiding there. And the gentleman at the front is <coughs> leaning forward. He's so keen. So you better have an answer on this question. Go Hello, on. I'm Pamela Corda, London South Bank University and uh, Honorary President of the Early Childhood Studies Degrees Network. And I wanted to ju just ask a question about gender. And gender in your first analysis, you've got um, sort of average wages. Yeah. I think, I suspect that if you actually broke it down by men and women, you would see women in, the, in those poorest groups. Yeah. And similarly okay. to John, you mentioned uh, the environment as something that you were um, con concerned with. You didn't mention anything to do with what I would see, the structural changes that would be needed to make any changes to women's position. Yeah. Okay. Great. Go ahead, sir. What's William your name? Claxton Smith. Uh, John, a number of your proposals on renationalisation and PFI seem to indicate a move away from the historic and perhaps unfortunate obsession with gross national debt as the only item on the balance sheet which matters. Is this a sort of different sort of thinking which is underlying much of your policy, that we look at the assets on the balance sheet as well as the liabilities? That's great. And over there. Go ahead, Martin. Hi, I'm Martin Sambo from the Financial Times. Um, you made a compelling case, I would say, that... Uh, the challenges of the uh, UK economy, the, the shortcomings of the UK economy, are largely a predictable effect of an econo economic model that encourages companies to uh, choose <laughs> low-paid but low-productivity labour <coughs> rather than investing in productivity-enhancing capital. And as I understand you, you propose to change that uh, by various policies to raise labour standards, higher minimum wages, greater representation for workers, um, and stricter and better enforced standards, uh, I presume. I think of that as a Scandinavian solution uh, because that's what is the Scandinavian experience. Now, my question is, when you succeed in that, will you not at the same time, almost as a side effect, have addressed the main concern about immigration, which is that uh, migrant workers drive down standards because you will have put a floor on the standards. So will not a side effect here be that you will have removed... Uh, any argument for ending freedom of movement of labour and therefore for leaving the single market? Uh, the, um, I was wondering when you were going to get to Brexit there, Martin, but uh, <laughs> we got it at the end. Right. The, um, uh, we'll just, Pam, quickly on your question on gender. So th everything I've shown you is household incomes. Yeah, yes, so so that, that's why it doesn't show gender, for the obvious reasons. Um, the, um, on, on the pre-distribution thing I said to you about earnings at the moment, women are actually doing best... Because they're, just because they're doing best because they are, they are worst, if you see what I mean. They are lower earners, and so they do best when lower earners do better. So on that side of things, they're doing well. Insofar as um, women are, in cash terms, the main beneficiaries of lots of support for <coughs> children in families, as in the tax credit system and others, how that... In, had, yeah. well, so one, it's changing on the universal credit, and two, it's being cut a lot. And so in that, the tax and benefit stuff does affect women the hardest, particularly if they have a lot of kids. And it, I haven't shown you this, but in the report, we touch particularly on what's likely to happen to people with more than three kids, and particularly to Bangladeshi and um, Pakistani families who look like they're set to see the worst income growth over the next few years, insofar as we can say. So, yeah. But yes, there's lots of other things to come in. Do you want to come in before John deals with a raft of... Uh, no, questions. no, I thought they were all for John. They're all for John, fine, no, that's a bit of a cop-out. <laughs> right, come on then, John. So, John, you've got, uh, okay, we've got okay, gender okay, renationalisation. Okay, let me just come on to that. Yeah. Um, we work closely with the Women's Budget Group. Um, their analysis, 86% of the cuts have fallen on women's shoulders. That's why if you look at what we put forward in the grade <coughs> book and in the manifesto itself, that addressing of those issues, particularly around welfare benefits in particular, but also 
this isn't just stereotypical, but it, the, the reality is around social care in particular. And the Women's Budget Group did a report which was excellent about the investment that can go into social care, particularly with regard to um, pay and practices that go on. And actually the investment in social care will generate more jobs and more well-paid jobs if, if um, the investment goes in than actually industrial investment, quite remarkable. And in that way would assist in the demand issues that we want to address in the economy. So again, what, you, what you've seen is on the investment side, we've looked at how we invest in those services that can lift the burden off women in particular. In addition to that, how we address the benefit issues that have, that have hit them significantly hard. Um, we've also, obviously, what we've tried to do is in terms of our development of equalities legislation is to ensure that we tackle the gender pay gap, not just by reporting, but active enforcement as well. That's one of the ideas around having an effective ministry for employment so that you do get a proper enforcement of those issues as well. Um, the, the other aspect goes into all the aspects around skills training as well and how we, we now, I'm not sure if it's the right expression, different people use different expressions, but we're now going through this exercise, work, working with people like the Women's Budget Group, how we gender proof all our policies, <coughs> how we examine their implications for, them, for, for, for women in particular and how we draw upon that expertise. And you'll see in the development of consultations in the coming months, um, exactly how we want to go about that. Yesterday, even in the finance bill, um, we raised the whole range of, um, and Dawn Butler there, this was a historic occasion. She was not a member of the Treasury team, she's our quality shadow minister, actually spoke on a, a finance bill um, on the in introduction of equality assessments into the financial measures brought into that finance bill. And that's what we'll do in every, every approach that we do in the, in the future. Um, with regard to the, um, how, we're, how we're addressing the deficit, we've introduced our fiscal credibility rule, very straightforward. We don't borrow for day-to-day -day expenditure, but we will borrow for future investment. And yes, it is basically uh, straightforward ONS and accountancy rules that if you do bring something into public ownership, you're acquiring an asset. And our argument around these assets as well is that they're all profit-making, on that basis they'll pay for cover any debt that we incur as a result of them bringing into public ownership. And, and it's just historically been about hiding well, the debt off balance sheet. It, 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 it was, it was, but don't let me uh, don't let me introduce the reputations of past Chancellor of Exchequers on this matter. But um, look at the I think he already has. I know. <laughs> but look at what happened on London Underground. The National Order. Office report on London Underground, PPB brought back in house, NAO report, £470 million worth of savings. So again, um, there are issues there where we think because of the high proportion of debt on these PFIs, the potential for renegotiating that will save us money in the long term and enable us also to stabilise the services upon which the PFIs are now <coughs> a drag. Uh, and example after example comes from that and you saw what happened to him at Bart's where Bob Kerslake resigned as a result of the funding there that was taking place and a lot of that was to do with the PFI that was imposed upon them. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the issue around migration, we, look, let's be absolutely clear, we've, in the referendum campaign, uh, we campaigned for Remain and we were defenders of, of free movement, but we also campaigned on the basis of Remain and reform. And therefore, there were issues around free movement and other aspects of the EU that we wanted to see reform, which we felt could overcome a lot of the perceived disbenefits that people saw and motivated them towards the, the, the Leave camp. We still feel that, that view. We think that on a lot of the measures that we can introduce to ensure that we have proper skills training, that we can meet the, tr um, the needs of our economy um, from, <coughs> from our own population as much as we possibly can, but the way in which we ensure people are properly paid, that we have proper trade union rights and recognition in this country that will enable sectoral bargaining and therefore undermine the ability to undercut wages. A lot of these issues will overcome some of the concerns that people have had about Im immigration in the past, of course. Um, and that's why it's never been a key issue for us uh, and, uh, uh, in terms of why people have, have um, been motivated into the leave, because we thought we could overcome these issues anyway, and we still do. There are a whole range of other issues, obviously, that people were concerned about when they um, voted to leave, and we, we will seek to address those and reassure people. Um, we respect the referendum result. We respect that. But what we feel is that in developing a new relationship with Europe, 
we can gain many of the benefits that we <coughs> have in, 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 in the EU and we can overcome most of these perceived disbenefits that people had, like the, the concerns they had about immigration. Um, Martin, your, your question is, if that all happens and it all goes cosy, why can't we just keep freedom of movement as it is, basically? Is that your... So if you no, were in government no, today, was, would you want to? No, it was further than that, wasn't it? It was, it was about... Yeah, why don't we just remain within the single market? Or oh, the lot, you want the lot. I, okay. We'll the, because I, I think, as I say, we respect the referendum result, and I think most, many people who voted for Leave and others may not feel that's respecting the result itself because we have to adopt all the four freedoms. We think, we think we can develop a new relationship with Europe which overcomes many of those perceived <coughs> disbenefits and that's why we think we can get as close to the single market as we can and gain the benefits from that single market. Great, let's get some more questions. The, um, the gentleman right in the middle, who's given it's cold, has got a puffer thing on which is very sensible. It's not cold in here, I hope. The, um, and then the gentleman on the left there. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Simon Jeffrey from Centre for Cities, um, and that covers the big cities, Birmingham, Bristol, but also down to your Mansfield and Burnleys and Blackpool. So we cover the whole range of places, not just focusing on, on that big metropolitan areas. It was really good to hear your focus on you know, the impact of technology and artificial intelligence. That's something that we've looked at, and you know, the history of automation has impacted you know, different parts of the country differently. You know, the South has constantly gotten the best of it, and the better jobs that have come from automation, and it's been northern places that, that haven't. Uh, the question, my question to you is, the focus in your speech that I did hear on you know, regional disparity was strongest on transport infrastructure, when actually it's the skills that is the barrier to these places to having the greatest benefit from this coming wave of automation. So, you know, talking about Huddersfield, where would you have your priorities? Would it be on a tram, on trains, or would it be on what we think is the bigger disparity, which is skills, and that's you know, yeah. adult education through to the actual... Yeah. The, the early years of the primaries and the secondary schools that are okay. part of the divide. Great question. Gentleman over here. Thank you. Uh, Liam Kelly. I'm a housing consultant. John made a reference to land value tax. Uh, I'd like if you could elaborate on the practicalities of implementing that. And I'd also be keen to hear Stephanie's perspective on it. Liam, great. Anyone else? And, uh, Rob, I oh, um, Richard Partington from The Guardian. Um, I know we've spoken briefly about the single market there, and it seems as though Brexit is uh, a huge issue when it comes to beating these forecasts, as, it, as we've seen from the, uh, the, the leaked government documents. Um, one element that might be able to encourage businesses to invest more in productivity-boosting enterprises is more clarity on, on whether the UK remains a member of a customs union. Is that something which the Labour Party would like to guarantee? Very good. And there's a lady here. Uh, thank you very much. Liliana Pop, an independent researcher. I just wondered, uh, again, on the question of Brexit, um, are there any uh, circumstances under which you would um, <coughs> see a second rec a referendum as being justified? All right. Why don't you kick us off on... You can give us a view on second well, referendum if you no, want, um, and land value tax. Well, land value tax is... Uh, look, I think if you did a poll of uh, economists... 99.9% uh, .9 would favour some form of land value tax and would certainly favour increasing the general burden of taxation on land relative to where it is now. But I think there's a, um, if you did a similar poll of governing politicians, you would find 99.9% .9 were not willing to introduce one. And I can't help uh, noticing the, the contrast between those two. You know, there has been, there have been times where Governments have had the wind behind their sails, all possible incentive and political capital uh, to change, even move in that direction. Um, and they have either chosen not to or been ch hugely punished for trying to do that. So I think it's one of those areas. I think for us, what is a great shame is to have actively moved in the opposite direction over the last few years, particularly you know, not just in the refusal, <coughs> the refusal to do the revaluations on council tax, but also in the moves that have been made on inheritance tax. You know, clearly, in any kind of uh, global discussion around the balance of taxation on capital and labour, any of those things, you would be moving in the direction of greater taxation of at least inherited wealth, which is in the UK would be primarily property wealth and better basis for land taxation, if only to help local councils. All of those things seem to be blindingly obvious, but 
if you're uh, the gentleman to my right or uh, any other person who's trying to win power these days, I think you have to pick your battles. And if you're going to do that, you have to do it in a very clear way where you think you know what your, what your arguments are going to be. And even then, I would argue the last Labour government's one was as good a proposal as you might have had. And I think it, going back to what I said at the beginning, the way that debates can get distracted mm -hmm. by one issue, <coughs> uh, that particularly this question of retroactivity, you know, anything that seems to hint of retroactive, well, I bought this house, I didn't know you were going to tax it that way, it, is where you get into enormous trouble. And that's why it still makes me worried when John's talking about, well, we're going to treat different water companies differently. I'm sure they deserve to be treated completely differently. But if you do that, you're going to start this whole other debate. Do, do you really want to get into that? Um, because you're questioning the basis of, of under which people enter contracts, etc., etc. Are you in favour of another referendum for a laugh? <laughs> uh, personally, yeah. I am in favour of one if it becomes an overwhelming desire of people to have one. But I think it's no, no, a I complete mean, I, cop out. No, I don't think it's a cop out. I mean, I am a Democrat, and this thing people are very sniffy about people saying I respect the democratic view. You, you have to because all the conditions that went into that vote will be worth all of the disaffection and the lack of trust of elites will be worse if there's a perception that people have also had a decision reversed on them, unless there is an overwhelming desire. I think if it is, pe if it is in the, if there's an overwhelming desire to be able to make a decision on the deal as it's presented, and we have the capacity to do that, which I'm not sure we will have the opportunity to do that, I think maybe, maybe we can make the case, but it has to, has to be absolutely clear that this is not just a stitch up. And I can't, at the moment, I can't see why it wouldn't be considered a stitch up. John, on a stitch up or others? Okay, <laughs> just on the water, just to clarify what I said. I said <laughs> we're keeping all the options open on that, and it may well be we, we look at the treatment on different aspects of it. But um, and actually on water, there's such popular demand of it, we're going to have to move in some form. Someone, I live in Hammersmith and I've been living with all of the burst yeah. mains for the last, that are right next to my kids' school. So I <laughs> have right, we don't need the great incentive to London. treat Thames water okay, differently than everybody else. <laughs> 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 Special meeting there. Rather than leaking mains. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can I just run through the questions yep. that were thrown at me? Um, in terms of the, the cities and what comes first, is it skills or infrastructure? The reason I was smiling, because we... <laughs> In virtually every discussion I've had in a small town around the country, that's exactly the, it's the chicken and egg thing that's come around all, all the time. And a lot of people are arguing that we're losing the skills here because the people are just moving away because we haven't got the infrastructure to keep them. So it, it, literally you have to do both. It's as simple as that. But uh, all the places that I've been at, uh, I tell you the potential is enormous. Most of the um, smaller towns I've been at, uh, the, the, the host... It's been largely the local authority, but often it's been the, the local university or the local FE college. And they just want to display the potential that they've got and the skills and the little niche markets that they begin to develop around the skills that they're developing in that particular education institution. And so I just think um, we're awash with the potential and part of the potential is being wasted because we haven't put the digital or transport or other forms of infrastructure in. So I'm afraid skills and infrastructure goes hand in, in, hand, in hand. And also the, the, the importance of the, the infrastructure is that it, it reflects the regional needs. And that's why this issue, this issue around localism is sig absolutely significant about letting people lo locally and local businesses, trade unions and the local community representatives coming together to work through their own economic plan for their particular area and what their needs are and try and get that level of communication to decision makers. That's why relocation and dev devolution of decision making is complete, is, is one of the key aspects for us so they fully understand what's happening on, on the ground. Um, in, terms of <laughs> in terms of land value tax, um, We've, uh, it's been knocking around for years, we've been debating it for years, exactly as Stephanie said. Um, up until now, it's, it's never been, uh, politicians have never been able to sell it properly in a, in a way that's gained sufficient support for implementation. But um, I think because of the issues that we're facing at the moment, particularly around the funding of local services, there may will be a window of opportunity to have a rational debate about this. And there may be an opportunity as well of, uh, piloting some aspects of this as well as you go into government. But again, it's a tough one. It is a tough one, but it's a tough one that's, I think we're at a stage where the decline in terms of funding to local government 
and the consequential effect on local services, many of them are in crisis, means that I think people are now willing to consider more radical solutions than they have in the past. Um, in terms of, um, let's go back, let's, let's go back to Brexit. Um, it's, look, in terms of whether we have another referendum or not, I was asked this question, I think, on Mar or, or Peston the, the, other, the other week. Um, we respect the existing re referendum. We respect that. Um, I'm up for any forms of democratic engagement, to be honest. My view, if we were going to have, if, if we were going to have, I'd rather have a general election, to be honest, than a referendum. The referendum sometimes can be everyone's, everyone's um, concern or worry uh, going into one particular the vote rather than actually addressing that particular issue as well. There, there needs to be a wider debate about the, the future of the country, setting the fu our future relationship with Europe in that context. That's why I'd prefer general election. But we're, all, we're keeping all options open um, and, and we'll, we'll see where we go. Interesting enough, on all the polling that we've seen, analysis of polling that we've been doing in, in, in recent weeks and drilling down into it, that hasn't been the shift. There hasn't been a shift. It's virtually 50-50 at the moment. There have been some shifts. What I found fascinating uh, from the analysis of all the polar polls, there's been some shift, but it's been both directions. And it, so they've cancelled each other out. So it is virtually the same as what was at the referendum. And what I worry, and this is, <coughs> this is the politician talking, what I worry about is if we go into another referendum anytime soon, you'd be opening up uh, the potential for some of the right-wing xenophobic politics that we saw from UKIP and others, and I don't want to see that opened up again. I think we need a much more rational debate. In some instances, you know, we're having the rational debate about Brexit now that we should have had more in more detail before the referendum itself, and that's what we've got to encourage. And I'd rather have a debate now about the future of our country and the future of our country in the context of its relationship with Europe. And that becomes much more visionary that people can then understand and have a better view on rather than that one particular question itself. But coming back to the customs union, uh, you know our position. Our position is, yes, we want to see uh, on the table a, a customs union negotiation, not the customs union at the moment. We think there could be a reform. What we've said consistently is I think a customs union is the way forward, particularly to solving some of the issues around Northern Ireland. What we're concerned about is that the, the, uh, the government have, have ruled even that option off the table, I think they might have to come back and address it. Yeah. Great. Well, let's get one few more questions and then we're going to, have to release John to the outside world. There's a gentleman here. Joe You've got a microphone coming. Wait a second. Joe Nadeeb, though. I've got a question about social care. Um, social care is chronically <coughs> underfunded and, and there's no sign of that changing any time soon. Yeah. Would yeah. you consider revisiting the Deal Not report and trying to yeah. increase funding that yeah. way? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Get another question. Hi, uh, Matt Dathan from the Sun. Um, just on the customs union, do you accept that staying in a customs union, John, um, would mean that uh, a Labour government would, would, wouldn't be able to strike new trade deals with the rest of the world? And just a minute ago, you said um, you're not in favour of staying in the custom, customs union at the moment. So what, what did that mean? And oh, sorry, no, sorry, you misread me. You and sorry, one one no, final no, question: no. Did you ever meet uh, Czech uh, diplomats in the 1980s? In this basement. No, yeah. anyway. Anyway, right, fine, okay. Well, you've done work, we've taken us quite a long time to get there, right. so you've done all right, we've done all right getting there. And you didn't have a dodgy KGB joke either. Your son headline writer will be very upset. I didn't get a joke. You didn't get a chance, right, okay. Um, anyone else not of the male persuasion want to finish us with the last question? <laughs> look at you all, you're all, male. look at all these men, you're a man, you're everywhere. Right, that's it, well, let's wrap up there then. Let's just take those two. John, social care cash, okay. uh, A customs union okay. and checks. Um, Barbara Keeley is leading for us on social care. Um, she'll be uh, undertaking a more detailed consultation ar around this whole area. Um, we're going to look at the Dilnot proposals again. In fact, I, th I think Bob is trying to have a conversation with, with Dilnot to have a proper detailed discussion about that. And we're going to keep all the options on the table and, and have a proper consultation. See what we can do in terms of um, immediately um, urging the government now for more funding around the this is a spring statement, not a spring budget, but what we're saying to the Chancellor, you've got to address some of these issues now because, again, social care is collapsing at the moment. Um, we, put in, we put in the grey book uh, a two billion to get us through this year. Um, it w it, we think at the moment the way things are going, particularly some of the closures that might happen as well, there needs to be immediate investment again. Um, again, um, 
it's, it's, it's one of those things that's coming up through local government all the time as well. Uh, it's one of those basic civilizing foundations of society that's collapsing around our ears and um, in our constituency surgeries it's happening all the time now, um, particularly around elderly social care. But can I say also, um, if you look at the children's services aspect of social care as well, um, the charities as well as the local government association, I think on a cross-party basis, have raised the issues around children with special needs and access to the support that they have, which is um, being withdrawn and cut. Um, we've also got record levels since the 1980s now of children coming into care, and part of that is around the cutbacks and early interventions. And this is, you know, this is no cost saving, because we don't have the early intervention, it costs more when they go into care itself. But again, we'll be pressing the Chancellor for some moves, even though it's not a spring budget, we're saying it should be, and you're going to have to do something urgent around social care in particular. Okay. Um, uh, let's go back to the Customs Union. Uh, when I said um, the Customs Union for the moment, it wasn't for the moment. We, we're, we're not supporting membership of the Customs Union, but we are looking at a Customs Union. And the, release, the reason we're saying a Customs Union is because we don't want the same asymmetric relationship that Turkey has got. What we would want is to negotiate around our ability, therefore, to influence the trade negotiations that would take place um, on behalf of us all, both ourselves and other European countries, in, in terms of trade, via a customs union. And that will be the dis discussion that, that we want to open up. Um, no, I have not met any Czech um, um, uh, spies, etc. Um, the allegations that I was um, a KGB agent um, was at the time I was a council officer in Camden. Um, I promise you I was not selling secrets to the KGB about Camden's policy on the <laughs> development of housing in their area. Um, or less. I was, there is, I'll try, I'm not allowed to tell jokes anymore, but I'll look, blow it. Because um, I went into the shadow cabinet the other week, it says, to Svitya Tavarci, Tavaric. And I said, you haven't read the papers this morning, have you? <laughs> anyway, I've been told there's a group of KGB colonels now that are suing the sun for associating themselves with us. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old colonels. Right, the, um, great. Well, on, um, just going back to where we kind of started in some ways on, and you spend, you know, some of us spend time in Stoke, you get to spend time uh, further around the world, but w when, when you look at kind of where we are now and Britain's relative underperformance in the context of that coordinated global recovery, what's your gut feeling about whether we last as underperformers or we pick back up and catch up, assuming you don't. Uh, assuming we don't get your boom and bust happening. No, no. I mean, I think that you know the irony is that we have we're getting the best out of our trading relationship with with Europe in just these two years. You know, this is when uh, you get more coming in from exports. Exports have been doing doing pretty well. Um, I guess the longer you know, that is where Brexit comes into this because the longer you just have the continued kind of relationship we have, whether it's frictionless or anything else. Um, the more we will benefit from this global recovery, um, but if we're if we if we're casting huge doubts on that, let alone facing any cliff edges, then that will be a good way for us to fail to get the benefits out of this last few years of recovery. Uh, great, that's suitably grim to end on. <laughs> the, um, well, look, can we thank our uh, panel for coming today? <laughs> yeah. And hopefully, if we, if we leave you with nothing else, it's that, yes, Brexit is a massive deal, but one of the lessons of Brexit is that we've got to sort out some of these underlying problems about Britain, because what the country wants yeah. is to be brought back together and to succeed in the 21st century, not just to stay angry and make it about, about the past. make it about the future. What's and the with future. Winston Churchill, if you have a battle between the present and the past, you lose the yeah, future. Exactly. Ah, very good, OK. Just to give us even further pessimism, thank you. No, no, anyway, look, no, have no, a good no, day. No. It's sunny outside, but it is cold. That's positive. <laughs>